Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Hey, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of the Muscle Expert Podcast. I am your host, Ben Pakulski. And you guys know that my mission in life is to empower you with the knowledge and skill set to truthfully live an awesome life that you love. Surround yourself with great people, do things that make you happy. And this episode is an interview with Christina Rice, who is an amazing lady who is empowering women across the world with the exact same mission that I have. And she's just trying to make you guys realize that life can be fun. Life can be full of great energy, great people, great food, great experiences. And this conversation is very, very casual. It's not going to be your typical science deep dive, but it's going to be a really, really lighthearted, uh, emotionally invigorating conversation. Uh, we talk about how to eat, um, how to frame your mind around truthfully living a great life that you love, um, how Christina overcame some really, really deep emotional and psychological and physical issues to begin her journey uh, toward living her greatest life. And this is just a really fun, awesome conversation where we kind of go back and forth on our skills, strategies, and tactics to live an empowered, happy life with a smile on your face uh, and continue on forward empowering people. So I hope you enjoy this podcast with Christina Rice. And as always, if you enjoy it, listen right to the end, leave us a review. And Christina would love to hear from you guys, either on social media, Instagram, or one of her podcasts, Wellness Realness or Straight Up Paleo. Check her out on iTunes and anywhere you guys find your podcasts. Enjoy the episode. Um, so I, you know what? The reason I'll tell you transparently, the reason why we reached out to you was my uh, business manager that loves you. She listens to your podcast and she says we have so much in alignment as far as how we approach uh, life uh, and nutrition and training and such because, um, you know, the idea around eating whole foods and the anti-inflammatory diet, that's literally the way I articulate it. And uh, living this holistic life that encompasses body, mind and soul um, all sounds, uh, you know, like we're talking the same language. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad that your business man manager listens to my podcast. That's she does. very <laughs> nice of her. Tell her thank you. Yeah. I she's bet awesome. I like her. <laughs> yeah, no, she's awesome. And uh, she spoke very highly of you. So I was like, all right, let's do this. Yeah, um, I would. Yeah. yeah. And I love finding people like you who are into this lifestyle too, because I feel like there's this whole disconnect between. You know, there's a lot of people who are coming from the bodybuilding world, and I think everybody has kind of judgments about each other, you know, mm -hmm. how you're saying people might think that you eat a certain way or live a certain way, and you don't. You take a more holistic approach, and I like just showing people that you can yeah, do whatever. Yeah, and you know, so, yeah, so I'm training some guys now, and I want people to realize that um, you, know, you can build a tremendous amount of muscle and still be healthy. It doesn't have to be this mindless bro science meathead life that mm -hmm. is unhealthy and uh, ultimately unhappy. And that's that's the bigger thing, right? It's like people don't realize how uh, lonely and empty and unhappy a bodybuilding, even a fitness life is. I don't know if you've ever competed, but no, you, you completely alienate yourself and yeah. you destroy your body just to look good on stage for 10 minutes and you destroy your relationship with food because as soon as you come off, you want to eat everything on the planet. And it ends up, particularly women, it ends up hurting a lot of women. And I don't know if you get to interact with a lot of women like that, but there's a huge concern there. Yeah, I mean, me personally, when I first started getting into fitness, I did not compete or anything, but my cousin was the one who was just teaching me about exercise because I had no idea what to do. And he basically gave me like a little split and like told me what to do at the gym. And I was following a very bodybuilder style exercise routine and diet because that's just yep. what I thought was healthy. And it did take, it took over my life and it was like a full-time job and it definitely was very isolating. So I can't even imagine, you know, for people who are actually competing how much so that happens. Yeah, and I think, you know, training like a bodybuilder actually has some value and some merit for most people because most people are so anti-muscle and mm -hmm. uh, wrongly so. And I think, you know, with some with some semblance of muscle building oriented training makes a lot of sense. But 
Um, that being said, it doesn't need to be this one time a week bro science split that, you know, you must train this much and this hard. At the end of the day, you must love what you do. And I think that's a huge mistake that people make is trying to fit a square peg in a round hole or believing that there's only one way to skin the cat, right? Like mm -hmm. if, you're, if your objective is living this, half healthy, this healthy, happy life, then it's so important that you love it. And for many years, you know, speaking about myself, I hated it. And every time I went in the gym, I had this negative anger association with building my body. So every time I felt my body, every time I contracted my muscles, it would, it would bring back this anchoring of, of negativity and, and uh, ultimately, you know, discontent. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a huge thing. People start to realize that um, every time you go into that gym or that place where you're physically active, you have to have a smile on your face. You have to bring joy into your body and actually love it. And that's how you transform your body, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than and hating like, oh, I have to do cardio. Well, don't do it then. Yeah. <laughs> go do something else. Go go ride a bike. Go um, swim. Go I don't know, play soccer. Like that. that's way more effective with a big smile on your face than dreading going and walking on the treadmill for an hour. Yeah, I think also just being aware that things can change too. Like, you know, for me, what the way I was exercising I was really happy with, I loved it. But then after a while, it became just a chore. And then I didn't realize that it wasn't making me happy anymore. You know, I was just going through the motions and I said, I just have to do it because it once did make me happy. You know, yeah. so just being aware that sometimes things change and it's good to switch it up also is really important, I think. So what does your current routine look like, your exercise regime? Actually, right now I am following MAPS Anabolic because oh, my nice. friends over at Mind Pump have challenged me to start doing their programs. So for a while, I mean, I, I before this I would just program my own stuff and I was mainly doing like an upper lower split. I work out from home yep. um, with dumbbells. I just have adjustable dumbbells and honestly... I feel like it's the same as me going to the gym because I'm not really a big machine person either and I can do a lot with heavy dumbbells, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so that works for me and before that it was much more, you know, before that was much more like one body part a day, the kind of split and then I transitioned into like... Are you a bro, Christina? No, but I, I mean, that <laughs> was what, funny. that was what I, I was taught and I was like, all right. I mean, I came from, I had no idea what exercise was really. You. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then I tried doing the cardio thing and I was like, I'm not into this. And then when my cousin gave me, a, he was like, just do this at the gym. And it was like a split and I was like, okay. And I really liked it. Um, and then eventually I started doing my own thing and I was doing that for a long time. I got bored. My friend trained me for a bit and she has a very, her style's kind of like it's kind of crossfit without being crossfit like less intense not as heavy weights but very crossfit inspired i would say um and then went back to my own thing and then now i'm doing the maps anabolic so more full body um and we'll see how that goes but i'm open to anything really nice so tell our listeners a little bit about your history so um you have a very interesting uh, story as to how you found health and fitness. Yeah, for most of my life, it was very unhealthy. I had a lot of digestive issues and I struggled a lot with my mental health as well. I had an anxiety disorder, really bad depression, clinical depression. And when I got to college, things kind of hit ahead and my digestive issues became worse than ever before and i kind of just couldn't go on living like that my mental health really really went down i was really depressed and i fell into binge eating and my binge eating disorder lasted for a few months and then i just thought i need to pull myself out of this and i've always had a very type a perfectionist personality and i said okay I am going to become really good at being healthy. Like this is going to be my new thing that I'm a perfectionist at. So the next day, this is when I start deciding, okay, I'm going to actually go start exercising and I'm going to eat healthy. I didn't know what all that meant. So I started turning to the internet, reading everything I could on random wellness websites, bodybuilding.com, asking everybody I knew and 
I turned my health around big time with that. Um, eating better and exercising made me feel much better, but my digestive issues were still really, really bad and I could barely function and I basically stopped digesting food. I was seeing a lot of different doctors. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I eventually found out I had some candida overgrowth. I, I st Like I said, I stopped digesting food and I dropped about like 40 pounds in three months and I'm a wow. pretty small person to begin with um you know I hit at my lowest weight I was like 74 pounds oh, geez. and at the same time I was really struggling emotionally um I basically felt like everything in my life had gone out of control because I couldn't I couldn't control my health no matter how hard I was trying I was eating as well as I could I was seeing doctor after doctor no one was helping me and the one thing that I could control was my exercise. So I became really addicted to exercise. Um, and I struggled with that at the same time as having these severe malabsorption issues. And basically, it took a while, but I eventually figured out kind of slowly what was going on with my stomach. And I had a number of bacterial overgrowth. So I had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and another a bunch of a few other um, bacterial overgrowth as well that I had to fix. I had a, you know, intestinal permeability, very real, leaky gut, whatever they want to call it. Yep. Major, major HPA axis dysfunction. Um, just, you know, all of the things. And it took a while. I had to, you know, drop out of college for a bit. I, w I went back, but I healed myself over time. I found a really great functional medicine doctor. I found this holistic way of living. I did a lot of my own research and, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the Western medical system seeing doctor after doctor and specialist after specialist, nutritionist after nutritionist, and no one was really helping me. So that was where I kind of decided I'm just going to do this myself and did a lot of my own research and kind of figured out how to heal my gut. And from there, just became really passionate about helping other people who struggled with anything similar. And that kind Did of- Did you identify yeah. the the primary stressors that were causing the anxiety and all these, these cognitive um, functions, dysfunctions in the beginning? Well, you know, I think a big part of this was my gut health and my, yeah. my physical health in terms of like, I was uncomfortable and in pain all the time, but also, yeah. you know, our gut is our second brain. You know, our sure. most of our serotonin is produced in our guts. And when our guts aren't functioning properly, that can basically lead to anxiety and depression. And this, this can lead Absolutely. to dental or mental health issues. So just the fact that that was so out of balance was a huge factor. But then there are also things in my life I was just... I was unhappy. I didn't feel a sense of community. I felt very lonely. I wasn't happy at school. I was at UCLA and I pretty much hated school. Um, I just didn't really have any relationships that I was really happy. I didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't feel like I had a purpose. You know, I, I wasn't doing anything for myself and I was just really stressed out and I couldn't, I couldn't really pin down why necessarily. Um, right. But I think that a huge piece of this was my gut health. And I, now that I'm so aware of my body, you know, I'm, I can really tell now when I, when I eat foods that don't work for me or when I'm not taking care of myself, like I can kind of, I kind of, it's been a journey fixing all of these different yeast overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth. And when I've relapsed before, I can tell emotionally more than I can physically like sooner so when I started to feel my mood get down and I thought I think I have candida again and I tested and I did so I'm very wow. aware and I can even tell that now like there are certain foods when I eat them I know I'm going to be depressed the next few days um, or I'm going to have really bad anxiety so it's pretty crazy how much it, it, it I can tell it affects me a lot yeah, it's definitely a double-edged sword, right? Chicken or the egg? Is it your brain or is it your gut? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's it's both. It's right? everything. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome that you were able to discover that. And it's funny how sometimes our greatest obstacle becomes our greatest opportunity for for improvement and for growth. And you've turned it into something that's absolutely amazing. And I think there's a lesson there for everybody out there. Is you know a lot of people are going through struggles and a lot of people have hard times in their life. And I always try to point that out. Is um, you know no matter how hard you're struggling, no matter how 
um, gloomy things may look, you have to look at it like, hey, this is my greatest opportunity to become the greatest version of myself sitting right in front of me if I choose to make it that way, which obviously you've done, which is awesome. Um, what were the, some of the biggest takeaways you learned from you know, what you're doing in the past um, that obviously caused these things and how you shifted it and made it a strength for you? You mean like what was I doing in the past that... To, that caused these gut problems? That oh, caused the, these yeah. high levels of anxiety? Um, I... Th- well, obviously, what I was eating. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I was eating. Talk about that though. Very standard American diet. I ate a lot of sugar all day long. Very high in ref- a diet high in refined carbohydrates. You know, I was eating like You're a- eating Sour Patch Kids. I was eating a lot of Sour Patch Kids watermelons. <laughs> I was eating um, toaster strudels, brownies. I like my croissants. I ate a lot of Power wow. Bars. I love Power you were, Bars. But you were lean, right? I'm guessing yeah. you were skinny or lean. So you're like, oh, I can eat this stuff. I'm good. Yeah. I mean, I was in- God, everyone needs to hear that. Yeah. That's why I, I wanted to ask no, that question. No, absolutely. And you know, for most of this, you know, I went through all this when I was in college and I've always been a thin girl, you know? And mm-hmm. when you're in high school, you just eat whatever you want and see no consequences you're not thinking about health and it's funny because when I was growing up people would say things to me and I've always been someone with a huge appetite like I ate a lot of food and I still eat a lot of food and people would say you know I really don't think it's good for you to eat that much candy or cake or ice cream or you know and I would say well look at me I'm fine I feel fine so I'll be fine and I would kind of flaunt it like I could just eat whatever I wanted and nothing happened nothing was going to happen and well guess what it all caught up with me and it was very intense and I wish I knew that now so even when you can't see it I think that people confuse weight with health big time and you don't know you cannot know someone's state of health just by looking at them you know, I don't care how thin they are, how ripped they are. That right. doesn't mean absolutely right. that they're healthy. You know, even, pe- you know, I've run into this a lot with a lot of my clients who are sort of comparing themselves to people they see and they see, well, she's lean and she's thin and she's healthy and she's happy and she does this. Why can't I do that? Well, you don't know what her health is really like. Does she have her period? Mm-hmm. How is, how are her, how's her thyroid? You know, like how are her mm-hmm. hormones? My brain goes right to brain health, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how's your mind? So if you're someone who's eating that much sugar and that much junk food, I can guarantee your brain is going to be destroyed. But, you know, you're you're chasing happiness outside of yourself. And that's that's one of the the best articulations for our listeners to realize is, like, if you have to eat because it makes you feel better or you're just doing it and more and more and more, you're realizing that you're you're going to have some type of neurotransmitter dysregulation. Mm -hmm. Your serotonin is going to be off. Your dopamine is going to be off. You're chasing this external feeling with with external means you know either yeah. you're going shopping or you're eating extra food and, and you're chasing these hormonal uh ups and downs and then you're not able to produce it inside and that that's where the dysregulation comes from and that's where this a lot of the people experience depression is they're you know they're using these external mechanisms to produce this internal uh response mm-hmm. and then their body stops having the ability to produce it and guess what now we have depression we now we have anxiety now we have gut problems gut dysbiosis and that and it's just a slippery slope that so many people live especially our female listeners exactly Exactly. And even, I mean, related to the brain function, just in terms of cognitive performance, on the other end of the spectrum, when I did change my diet and I was trying to eat healthier, I transitioned to a diet that was very just high protein, low fat and low carb, basically. And my cognitive function just plummeted. And during that time, it was really scary for me because I've always been a very good student. I've always been very sharp. I've always been known as a smart one. You know, I'd get teased for being so smart. And during that time when I was eating that way, I felt dumb. Like mm-hmm. I could I could feel my, my brain just stop functioning and people would talk to me and I wouldn't remember what they said the, the sentence before. You know, when I at work, I felt like I couldn't perform my best. I'd be given tasks and I was so slow or I could barely write. I was blogging for a company. I could barely write posts. And it was really, really hard for me because I felt like I'm eating healthy. How come I don't feel very smart anymore? And that was something that I really identified with as a person, as my intellect. And I, I totally lost it because I wasn't giving my brain any fat. (laughs) <laughs> so even on the other like, end of the know, spectrum HPA dysregulation right yeah that as well so all of those things are really tied into just cognitive performance and your emotional 
health as well big time um so I think that what I was eating was a big one and I wish I had recognized that and had more of thinking about health long term um which is also I just have this whole issue with our education system and I think that young people are not are not (laughs) we can go down that rabbit hole if you want because I'm on your side I mean they're not (laughs) taught anything about health or even when you're older you know even no one is given good even health a, information. Even a doctor. Exactly. Right, even doctors. Exactly. Three hours. And that's what's hard awesome. is these people who we are supposed to, you know, we put our health in their hands and we trust them and they don't have any education about this either. You know, like yep. to be honest, there are doctors who have who have a lot of great health information, but how did they acquire that? They went out of their way and they weren't just based off their nutrition lectures in medical school. Right. So one thing that I don't want to just gloss over, you were, you're just basically speaking about you're eating a high fat, sorry, a high protein, low fat, low carbohydrate diet. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. And then you, you notice a lot of cognitive impairment. And the reason I don't want to gloss over that is because I'm going to say there's a lot of listeners right now going, oh, that's what I do. How did you, um, what was the first sign you noticed that you're having cognitive impairment and uh, how did you reverse it? Hmm. The first sign. I'm not sure I know like a, a moment, but for me it was sure. it was really just that I could I was slower at things that you know I, I know how long it takes me to do certain tasks and I was a student and I was also working you know and all of a sudden something that I was used to doing in an hour was taking me two or three. Or did you notice any dependence on like stimulants and coffee and, and things like that to get you up and, and going? I personally didn't. I'm super reactive to caffeine and I've never done That's well good. with that. I'm the type of person right. where if I have two sips of coffee, I will not sleep for two days. <laughs> <laughs> so great. I really, yeah, I've never been one to, I only use those strategically when I needed to pull all nighters. Um, <laughs> so. I didn't depend on that, but I think for me, it was also really in my communication with people where I couldn't remember what people were saying. And I just felt slower. Um, I think also I was really tired all the time. Like I was just exhausted. And at the gym, you know, I, I used all of my energy every day for my gym session. And the rest of the day, all I could do was lay in my bed. Or sit at my desk. So what made you think it was the nutrition? What, what, like, what, you know, you had gut issues in the past. What made you realize that, hey, this must be like, I'm sure in your mind you believe you're eating healthfully, right? Like, God, I'm eating so well. Um, where, when was, what was kind of the, the light bulb moment? So I've always kind of, I have this belief that nutrition can heal almost everything. <laughs> um, not always alone, but I think it's a huge component and I, I put a lot of stock into that more so than I know most people do. And for me, that started when I was first researching things and trying to get to the root of my gut issues. And I started learning about basically the negative impacts of gluten and dairy. And I started learning about this just from random wellness bloggers on the internet and I didn't really know what I was doing, you know, and I... My, I did end up going to an urgent care facility and the doctor said, have you tried just taking out gluten and dairy? And I said, I mean, I thought about it, but I haven't actually yet. And just having somebody of quote authority suggest that made me want to try it. So I said, I'll try it. Why not? I'm willing to, I really like to experiment on myself, so I'll do anything. Right. So I cut out gluten and dairy and about two weeks after that, I just woke up and I felt like a new person and it was, Mm -hmm. it was incredible to me. I didn't, (laughs) I literally, my vision literally changed. So I didn't have to wear glasses to class anymore. Um, And I had this energy that I never felt in my whole life and my joints didn't hurt anymore. I always had really, really bad joint issues. Um, And those went away and I just felt so much better. And my digestion, it definitely didn't, it didn't it wasn't fixed but it did feel a bit better definitely but I had this mental clarity as well I felt like I was doing so much better in school and after I experienced that firsthand I just thought 
food is the answer. Like food is so powerful. Nutrition is so powerful. And then from then on in my whole health journey, I kind of always, whenever I had an issue, my my first instinct was what can I adjust in my food? So mm-hmm. later on when I was dealing with, you know, this cognitive impairment, that's why in my head I thought, okay, there's something wrong with my diet. There has to be because that was something that I had experienced could have such profound effects on my health and I had I had felt it before. So then I started researching more and started learning more about the importance of healthy fats and because it wasn't like I was afraid of them or going out of my way to avoid them. I just didn't even think about adding them because I think we grow up in this culture where we just Well, at least I didn't really use fat or add fat to anything, you know. So when I was eating health, when I was eating, quote, healthy, I just, okay, I'm going to make chicken. I'll bake it. Okay, I'll steam some broccoli, you know, and that's just kind of how I cooked. And then I realized, wait, I need to go out of my way to like add some fat. I should buy chicken thighs instead of chicken breast after I started researching more. And then I noticed a big difference i mean not immediately but within a week or so a big difference in my cognitive performance and i felt like i was getting myself back on track and i'm really glad i realized that in terms of my cognition because hormonally you know healthy fats are incredibly important and god only knows what would have happened if i had continued on that path of a very low fat diet with my health and that condition so sure your your body would have broke down at some point right yeah Hey, I interrupt this podcast with Christina Rice to bring you a special message from our sponsor, Four Sigmatic. So if you're not already part of the mushroom revolution, listen up because this stuff is going to change your life. So for the last six months or more, I've been diving into these mushrooms and mushrooms are very intriguing to me because they're obviously naturally occurring and have tremendous implications in a lot of different areas of your life. So if you're looking to upgrade your mind, lion's mane is amazing. It's like rocket fuel for your brain. And the best part is it's not taking away from your future. What that means is as you take stimulants, you're literally stealing energy from the future. What Lion's Mane is doing is actually helping you build a stronger, more resilient mind. And that to me is amazing. And I notice a tremendous difference when I do this over the long term. So Lion's Mane is about three grams per day. Sometimes I do a little bit more. I do six. Uh, But I actually notice a really big difference in my ability to form new memories and remember the things that I learn reading a book a week. And I try to remember those books rather than just read them for the sake of reading them. If you're someone who wants to calm down, reishi mushroom is a tremendous thing to be taking later in the day. I'll usually add it to my tea or I'll add it to just some hot water and drink it down. A Four Sigmatic makes a really nice reishi cocoa, uh, which tastes awesome. My kids love it. Um, Some other things you want to look at is cordyceps. If you're someone who's doing any type of endurance work, if you're doing CrossFit, if you're doing some any type of endurance training, cordyceps has been shown to have tremendous benefits on endurance, cardiovascular, uh, respiratory endurance. So if any of these products or the tremendous number of amazing products that Four Sigmatic offers are interesting to you, they're hooking you up. They're giving you guys 15% off for being a listener to the Muscle Expert Podcast. So if you want to get that, you can head over to forcingmatic.com slash muscle. You can also find it in the show notes and use discount code muscle, M-U-S-C-L-E for 15% off Forcingmatic. Peace. Enjoy the rest of the show with Christina Rice. Um, very important to realize, like, you know, you're talking about um, how much diet can influence your internal health. And it's it's so many levels, right? It, it's this food is is a signal. Food is a stimulus. And, and it's not just what we eat. It's how our body interprets what we eat. So it's how, our, when, you know, once it hits our stomach, what happens? Then once, you know, it's been broken down and digested, then it's absorbed in the bloodstream. Then what happens? So we have the microbiome interface. We have the inflammation interface. We have all these different hormones that interface with our, our cells and then how the cells use it and how well the cells are functioning. And there's so many levels to this nutrition piece that um, just indicate it has to walk down the path of your you have to be a healthy organism and i think that's the most important thing for everybody to to acknowledge it's not just one piece mm-hmm. um you know you get, you get so many people who say oh it's all about the microbiome or it's, it's hey it's all about your hormones or hey it's all about you know whatever pick, you know pick your poison 
um, and it's so important for, you know, you know, this mm-hmm. is like, it, it's all this integrated approach to making sure all of your, your body is working well. And that's why I'm very grateful to have you on this show is because you're one of these people who's, who's teaching people about this integrated holistic approach. And, and the one that, you know, I didn't mention, that's probably the most important of all is your mind, is your, is your brain and how your mind, um, exists the state of mind is going to deter- determine everything you know it's going to determine how your you mentioned your hpa access inter- interfaces with your um, autonomic nervous system which is going to determine your digestion and your ability to break down foods and so many things that um, all have to interface and interact for us to actually absorb these foods and actually live a healthy holistic life um, one of the things that you talk a lot about is not putting people in the boxes and learning how to um, you know, help people with their individual needs. How do you start walking down the path of identifying people's individual needs? Well, I think that people, first of all, <laughs> need to pay attention to what they're paying attention to because there's so mm-hmm. much noise in this space and everybody's just looking for the answer and everybody's looking outside of themselves for the answer. So the first thing to do is start making people aware of why they're making the decisions they're making and who they're listening to because a lot of people are just copycats i mean we all are at fault of this you know i did this i will read things and just be like oh it works really well for them i'm gonna try it and then you're you're just trying to force this way of life or way of eating on yourself and you're not giving your body a chance to tell you what it needs you know so i think that's a huge thing especially in this Instagram obsessed environment that we live in now, or at least my demographic is very much living on Instagram, just looking and watching what everybody else is doing and Snapchat. You know, we have this technology now that we're all paying attention to each other and what everybody else is doing is always on our minds. And this has really prevented us from being able to tune into ourselves. And I think that a lot of people have gotten they've just gotten away from being able to listen to their own body signals and needs. So I think that the first step is making people aware of who they're paying attention to, how that's making them feel, and just knowing, am I doing this because I want to or because someone else is suggesting I should do this? Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, you know, I'm glad you bring that up. And, you know, the Instagramification of the world is such that we're being led by people who look great or who do a really good job sensationalizing their life. And that's a really, really misguided place to react from, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just because somebody has abs, like like you say, or just because somebody uh, there has has a really interesting looking life doesn't necessarily mean they should be the people you should be following and modeling yourself after. And that's a really interesting um, paradigm for people to start to understand is um, it's not the people who necessarily look the best who are, who are the leaders or should be the leaders mm-hmm. because maybe they're just genetically blessed or maybe they're taking things that you're not knowing about that they're not transparent about. And uh, that's the unfortunate reality with Instagram, man, is we have these kids who are being led by monkeys. <laughs> and I say monkeys because it's, you know, monkey see, monkey do, and, and they have no thought process behind anything. Uh, and then these kids are going down these paths of, of um, misguided, um, sad realities. And then they have to, you have to fix a broken reality rather than giving them a skill set and empowering them from a young age. Um, it's a really hard place to be once you've already broken something. And, and the unfortunate reality is most people don't go looking for a proper solution until something breaks. And that's just human nature, I guess. Yeah, I think it's really, uh, it's kind of scary because I know, so when I grew up, you know, I would watch TV and movies and I could feel the separation between that is, uh, that's in a movie. That's not real life. You know, I could, I could mm-hmm. feel the, that. Now we have something on Instagram that's, that was started or Facebook, things that were started to share our real lives quote with each other that has been turned into marketing and it's not real life and the lines are blurred and people are expecting that to be real life, but it's not. And they're not realizing that a lot of these people they're following, it's, it's all an act. It's all for marketing. Everyone is trying to sell you something or tell you to do what they're doing, but you don't know what it's really like against the screen. And I don't think people realize how much of it can be faked. Yeah, it's all faked. I mean, ultimately, because <laughs> I mean, you're not going to show your bad days, right? You're yeah. always going to show your, your best days. You're going to show yourself when you've got your makeup on. You're going to show when you get your best smile. Uh, all these things are, I mean, how many selfies do you have to take before you pick the best one to put it up, right? Yeah. It's 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 never the first one. And that that's an important thing to realize. It's all uh, a filter. And um, 
I think we get it. I think, you know, people who are aware get it, but it's still influencing your unconscious, whether or not you care to admit, like as, as we look through your Instagram or someone else's Instagram, like I, I, I look up to you, like, I'm like, oh, this person's awesome. They're doing great things. And whether I, I'm aware of the fact that it's your best foot or I mean, not being you, but anybody, it's your best foot, it still influences you. And I think uh, it's important to realize that, you know, I've got children and, and what goes into your children's mind becomes the framing of their life. Mm-hmm. Um, so if if I'm if I'm comparing myself to great people or, you know, quote unquote, great people on Instagram, people who have these great facades and maybe I don't ma- match up to them and maybe I'm not able to um, if I'm not able to, to match up to these people. Now, all of a sudden, I'm going to feel depressed about myself. Now, all of a sudden, I'm going to start doing extreme things to try to live up to those lives. So it may be extreme dieting. It may be extreme exercise. It may be extreme hormone abuse You know, in our bodybuilding world. Um, there's so many things that um, are wrong about social media. And I hope we can bring awareness to people's mind that um, at, one, at one point, it, it's going to hopefully deteriorate and not be the, the thing that governs our reality. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it, it's definitely a facade and I think it's important that people like yourself can, can rise to the top and continue to just put forth a transparent, great message about, um, living a holistic, healthy and happy life. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so too. I just want people to realize, like, I think that people need to stop putting everyone else on a pedestal and just have some confidence yeah. in themselves. You know, like we have to be able to take in all this information and be like, all right, that's cool that works for them but that doesn't mean i have to do it myself i just had a really good conversation with somebody uh, actually dr anthony j about um dna and epigenetics and how you know everyone has different predispositions to um being better suited for particular diets so just because i see some dude over there or some girl over there who's got an awesome body and she's following a keto diet or she's following a bodybuilding style diet or she's following a vegan diet um, doesn't mean that my genetics are suitable for that. And that is so important. And that's the next piece, right? Mm -hmm. That's the piece that um, we don't really understand completely yet, um, but it's absolutely the next piece. And I don't think we're that far away from having a tool. Actually, I was talking to him about it on the podcast. Uh, creating a tool whereby you you submit your 23andMe DNA tests and you are you know, uh, offered in, in response a printout that says, hey, based on your genetic um, profile, based on your epigenetics, this is the type of diet that will be best suited for your body. I, I don't think we're, we're more than 24 months away from something like that, where literally everybody can then go and determine hey, this is what I should be eating based on my genes. Because some people don't absorb saturated fats well. Some people don't digest or absorb carbohydrates well. Some people don't detox uh, estrogen well. Some people don't uh, have properly functioning thyroid. Like there's so many levels that can be very easily influenced by um, what you eat. Yeah. And if we learn that, it's, it's a pretty easy road to go well, down. Well, we do have things like that. Um, I've definitely had a few tests done like that that have told me the best way for me to eat and I have a lot of clients as well and people who follow me who will submit their DNA and they'll say I got this back but my worry with that is you know then people get that information we still can't let that piece of paper dictate what's gonna work for us because I can tell you right now if I ate the way that piece of paper tells me I should be eating based on my genetics I might not feel my best because Okay, yeah, we're all different from each other in in terms of what diet, what macronutrient ratios work best for us, but we're also all different throughout our lives as well, or mm-hmm. especially as women throughout the month, throughout the day, you know? So, <laughs> um, yeah. estrogen definitely fluctuates throughout the yeah. month, that's for sure. Yeah, and just because a gene says that maybe this is better for you it also doesn't mean that gene is expressed and that gene you know it, it all depends on the expression of all your other genes and everything else is going on it's back to that saying you know like what is it genetics can load the gun but your environment pulls the trigger right yeah but that that's the thing is we can actually read epigenetics right so if we can actually have somebody give us a tool that tells us what our epigenetic expression looks like that's interesting to me right so just because you have a, a gene for something doesn't mean you express it correct, but we can actually read the genetic, exp- the epigenetic expressions of things now. I think th- um, which is fascinating. That's really fascinating. I just don't know how much I would trust that, especially when it's like, 
I don't know that a piece of paper can explain everything emotionally I've ever gone through that affects my being. Does that make sense? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a rabbit hole. But, um, yeah, I mean, sure. Um, because emotional you know, and mental trauma health. yeah, can totally yeah. affect internally what's going on. You know, if I'm, if oh, I'm stressed, I eat differently than when I'm not. Or I work out differently. You know? Yeah, but and not, I mean, regardless of what you eat, but what your body does with yeah. what you eat is completely different. You know, and that's the conversation that I'm leading the way in in, in fitness is um, teaching people in this muscle building space how everything's going to be governed by your HP axis and your interaction of your your autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And you know, this we all live this this overstimulated reality that um, you know it, I need to work out more if I'm not losing fat, or I need to. Uh, work harder if I'm losing, if I'm not building muscle, and you're just like, oh man, like don't even. Like, it, it's for most people, it's, it's, the, it's the worst thing you can do, right? Yeah. Like if your if your body's not responding, the last thing you want to do is more or harder. Mm -hmm. In many instances, right, with this overstressed reality we all live in. So, yeah, don't uh, you're preaching to the choir on that. Yeah, one. I also think that with I think it's so cool the way technology is going, but then I worry once again that this is another tool that's gonna stray people away from being able to tune into themselves because I truly believe that people can figure out what works for them if they are able to tune in themselves and they don't need, you know, oh, I wish, I wish I, I mean, I, I'm totally, I, I completely agree with you in, in principle, but 95% of the human beings that we encounter are asleep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the unfortunate reality, yeah. right? Like that's just, I mean, they, they just have no clue. And, and, and hopefully we can push people down the path of, of starting to pay attention to their body. But the reality is most people spend their more time trying to numb their mind and, and quiet their, their thoughts and, and not think than actually wanting to start to think, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you get in the car, you turn on the radio, you get home, you put on the TV, you, you know, you're, you're having a conversation with someone who's just constant blabble uh, rather than, hey, I'm actually going to sit down and be quiet for a minute and hear what my thoughts say and hear what my brain says and hear what my body feels. And mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately, maybe maybe my listeners and your listeners, uh, but <laughs> unfortunately, I don't think most people are, are even, that's not even on their radar. I know, I totally agree. And I think that that is why people have a hard time with me because I will not enable that. I will not enable that, you know, and I want to push people to stop numbing themselves. And you got to do the hard work to get in, back in touch with yourself. But I really think it's incredibly important. And I have this whole primal ancestral approach to health in my life. And I'm just like, you know what? The caveman did not have a DNA test. He figured it out. So you can too. You know, you got to buck up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I'm with you. But I'm, all, I'm also of the mentality of if I can accelerate that learning and understanding mm -hmm. a little bit, then hell yeah, I'm about yeah. it, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously, if, if a DNA test says, hey, you need to eat um, something that's outside of my comfort zone, then maybe I try it or maybe I don't. But maybe I have an objective assessment when it's done that says, uh, I didn't really feel good on that. I'm going to change yeah. it a little bit. And, there, and we both know that it changes weekly, monthly, yearly, anyways. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to, it, it would be nice for most people to have some type of guiding um, light that says, hey, you shouldn't do a ketogenic diet because your body doesn't use saturated fats well. That to me is a really important, important piece of Yeah, no, I think it's really, really useful for people to have that. Like, you know, if you have the a APOE4 gen genetic mutation, like you would want to know that. But I then, you know, people can take the information, try and incorporate it. And if their bodies are not responding well, take a step back and be like, OK, I'm not going to take that information like this genetic test as the word of God. And I'm going to adjust from there. I think it's more of just like people need to have take everything with a grain of salt. And at the end of the day, let your body guide you from there. You know, it's like using information, not just relying on it. Right. And then again, going back to the conversation of asking people to yeah. think and hopefully, yeah, hopefully we create thinkers. And that, I mean, that's ultimately what I teach in, in my muscle building life is uh, I try not to teach anybody any solutions. I try to say, hey, well, this is, I'm going to teach you how to think. And if we can teach that and allow people to make decisions, that's an empowering place to be. Um, so you'd say you talk, you, you live this um reality of trying to reduce uh, inflammation in your life and you try to live um, predominantly based on whole foods. Tell me what that looks like. In terms of my diet, um, I eat 
a whole fa- a whole foods based paleo style diet. So I eat a lot of vegetables. I eat a lot of healthy protein, some nice 100% grass fed beef, wild caught salmon, sardines, things like that. I like to incorporate organ meats and seaweed. Um, for extra nutrients, I will have some nuts and seeds. So basically like that, I like to make sure I'm using some good cooking oil. So I'll cook in avocado oil, coconut oil. You can use some nice extra virgin olive oil on your food, things like that, cooking in animal fats, just down to basics. But I think that reducing inflammation is obviously not just about diet. It's also about in your life, which means reducing all toxins. So I'm picky about the personal care products I use. Um, Uh, I'm very picky about that. I, I truly believe that this is actually more of a recent development. And I think that a lot of people have issues that they don't know about with mold toxicity and and heavy metals i think that those are two things that a lot of people don't realize are holding them back in terms of their health um they kind of fly under the radar and i think that my years of heavy makeup use with toxic products gave me heavy metal toxicity (laughs) um yeah so and or, or increase xenoestrogen. Yeah, at the very, at least, the very right? least. Um, but it's like now that I know more about what's going on with my gut issues, I'm realizing that these personal care products that I've been using have really been destroying not only my hormones, but also just really affecting my gut health as well. And so I'm really picky about, you know, the products I use on my body and also what I use, you know, like my laundry detergent and what I wash my dishes with and clean my, my apartment with. Um, And then inflammation comes from toxins just from poor personal relationships. You know, for me, a big part of healing was removing inflammatory people from my life, Um, honestly, you know, and making tough decisions, quitting jobs I didn't think I could quit, um, moving when I was not smart, you know, like try just kind of being selfish in that aspect in the aspect um and making tough decisions with who I surrounded myself with but it helped a lot a lot and then and then with exercise and slowing down and being busy like that all you do too much of anything you know I, I just feel like we live in a society where busyness going harder 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 is really glorified and that's not always the answer like you said like you mentioned um that can cause inflammation so just finding the right i hate using the word balance because what does that even mean but it's different for everybody but figuring out some kind of balance with those things sure um so you know that one of the biggest causes of of inflammation as you say just speaking to what you're saying is Mm -hmm. stress is cortisol and and when you're stressed your body's going to be inflamed you're not going to use sugars very well um, you're not going to digest food at all. Um, what are your, some of your best strategies that you use personally to um, mitigate stress? I love just going on calm walks. Walking outside mm-hmm. in nature is my best favorite stress reliever. And I really think that people underestimate the power of going outside and going on a walk, getting some vitamin D, um, being in greenery. Um and just walking is really, really helpful for when I'm stressed out. And I noticed a huge improvement in my mental health when I started being more active during the day. I think this is something that people yep. don't talk about enough. It's getting that neat in. It's just moving because I spent most of my life just sitting all day and then I'd get up to go somewhere and then I'd sit back down, you know. And now yep. that I make sure I'm just moving throughout the day I take breaks every so often just to move to walk around I like to just stay active I just feel so much better and if there's ever a day where I'm sitting all day I just I'm stressed out I don't even know why you know so I think that that's really helpful um I also am a big believer in essential oils. They are super powerful and they affect our limbic systems, really affects our emotional health. And when I'm stressed out, I will diffuse essential oils. I'll breathe them in. Um, I see that you use the same one my wife uses. What, what do you use to, uh, to calm your stress? The 
my favorite essential oil for stress is Serenity from doTERRA. I also love mm-hmm. frankincense, any lavender, um, I like rose. I think that those are just really effective and powerful. And honestly, thought that that was all very woo-woo until I just started doing it. <laughs> sure. But at the end of the day, I mean, any scent could, could be anchored uh, yes. in a serene way, right? So, it, you know, you could choo- choose anything. You could choose donuts. You could choose steak. I mean, it doesn't matter. You could, you could make that an anchor mm-hmm. for you. Uh, and make you feel any way you want. And I try to teach my people that. My, my coaching clients is, you know, we try to anchor. Um, some guys have a hard time um, going from work to home or they have a hard time going from work to the gym and becoming the person they need to be in that environment. So we use mm-hmm. anchors and we use um, positive anchors. We find any sense. And honestly, we sometimes use doTERRA um products where I'm like, Hey, every time you go into the gym, you know, I want you to sit in the car for five minutes and I want you to create that space that I want that you want to be in. When you go to the gym, you want to create the person you are, bring it back into your body, not just bring it into your mind, but actually feel the, feel the feelings. Uh, and when you do that, you smell this scent. Uh, and every time you do that, you're anchoring that scent in which comes, if you need to bring it back, you just smell the scent again. And all of a sudden now you feel like that person again, it bring, you know, sense of a very strong uh, association in our minds to bring back emotions and bring back mm-hmm. feelings. So if we have a really great set, we'll have that smell in our pocket and we'll, we'll bring it out, we'll smell it. And it can be anything. You could just put a couple drops on the back, back side of your mm-hmm. hand, right? Um, and, and you smell it and you anchor it and that brings that consciousness back into your mind. It's a really powerful thing um, because we don't realize how strongly we're, it's, we're to- associated to smells. So that's why I ask about your, um, your scent yeah, of Yeah, no, I love that you do all that. It's, it's really powerful. And it, I think a lot of people write it off because it almost seems too easy. You know, it's almost too mm-hmm. easy. But I'm like, no, this oil is like my protection. It's like my calming force, you know? So if I'm in a situation yeah. where I'm stressed out, I can just breathe it in and it instantly helps relax me. And I think another thing that really helps that's really easy, but just underrated is deep breathing, you know? And I realize this yeah. so much in my own body where I will just not breathe, you know? And I feel my shoulders are up, I'm tense and I'm not breathing. And so just to take a step back and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right, I'm going to take five really deep breaths in and out and take your time with it. It only takes five seconds. It really helps to put you back in that parasympathetic state. Yeah. It's funny. I do that with my kids. You know, I've got, um, mm-hmm. I told you I've got three kids and um, you, I mean, imagine <laughs> kids, right? Everyone pictures kids and like they're just running around the room like like you know, yeah. crazy people. And, 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 and when they're running and they're playing, that's great. But if we have them sit down at the table and you see them, like, their energy is just scattered, right? They're, like, swinging their legs, swinging their arms. They can't sit still. I'm like, hey, you know, everybody close your eyes, put your hands on your lap, and take three breaths. And it's amazing to me. It's truly ridiculous how fast, after literally mm-hmm. one breath, they're able to just be calm. They're able to just, like, chill out. And it's amazing how fast their nervous systems can adapt to, you know, eyes closed or open, taking one deep breath in, filling their belly, and then letting out as slow as they can. And now they're able to do that. Literally, one, I mean, I usually make them do three to five breaths, but they do one, and you could see a difference in the energy. And they don't even go back to being those scattered kids anymore. Like, what a, what a powerful skill set to have as yes. a student, right? Like, imagine being a kid in school like man i gotta do i gotta write a test and i'm all i'm all scattered oh we just take three breaths and you got this god i wish somebody had taught me that yeah i I wish i had that tool as well because (laughs) there are so many moments in my life where i just felt so overrun with anxiety and stress and if i had just known it could be that simple you know everybody has five seconds and and the reality is as an adult it's not that simple right because your nervous system your your, the amount of sympathetic stress is going to far outweigh your parasympathetic but once you've developed that skill then it, it is that simple. Like for you and I now, it's probably a matter of three breaths and we're, we're in this really calm, sympathetic, parasympathetic state. Whereas if you're someone is very stressed out and you can't even sit down and meditate for five minutes, if you can't, therefore you must, is one of my favorite <laughs> sayings. Is like, if you can't do something, you better make sure you do it because uh, until you develop that quality or that skill, uh, you're going to live a hard yeah, reality. I totally agree. I love that saying. That's a good one. Um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, from our deepest struggles develop our, our deepest, our, our greatest opportunities for, for character yes. growth, right? And that's kind of along the same strain. Um, just look for those opportunities for um, mm-hmm. growth. And, you know, if you if you can't meditate, I've got so many people that come here, oh, I can't meditate, man, I can't settle my mind. Man, it's just a matter of like what your expectations are, being able yeah. to sit there. 
and breathe and, and, and don't judge your thoughts and don't judge your movements and just try to realize that it's just because you're in a state of high sympathetic arousal that you can't. And if you learn to, you know, that my favorite new term is equanimity. And it's a matter of going into any scenario and not allowing it to influence you either positively or negatively. And, uh, you know, that's, that's meditation, right? Is I don't place judgment on these things that come into my mind. I just observe them. And, uh, that's, you know, one of the favorite, my favorite terms I got from a book I read recently. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's called Buddha's brain. Um, equanimity was, um, my greatest takeaway because it, the day that you can stop allowing things to influence you negatively and things to influence you positively. Now you're in control of your, your, your happiness. You're in control of your joy and you realize that you can create them inside of yourself and you're not dependent on things outside of yourself to influence your reality. And it's a beautiful yes, place to be. I love that. I think it ties in. I just published a blog post like yesterday or two days ago about the fear of failure and I think that that mm -hmm. ties in very much with this because I realized that so many of the I can'ts in my life were just it it's rooted in this fear of failure and what that would mean for me and it's like going back to something like meditation for so long I just said no I can't I can't well is it that I can't no I mean I could I just choose not to because I'm afraid to try and afraid that I'm going to quote fail but then what is failure really you know I've just decided that something means failure when really failing would be just not trying because if I try and it doesn't go as planned I learn something from that and like you said I'm growing right so then right. that's never yep. really failing there's also there's another side of that there's another side of that, right? And and the fear yes. of success is a very interesting conversation to have because, you know, one of my favorite sayings of all time is um, our deepest fear is not that we're in, we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. And when you start to explore people's fear of success, I feel that it's actually a greater hindrance than our fear of failure. Um, unconsciously, most people don't feel like they are deserving mm -hmm. of success. And so they don't try. And then, and there's all the, also the flip, flip side of, you know, some people's ego just tells them that they are adequate or inadequate, either way you want to flip it. Um, but there's so many levels of exploration there that I've been diving into and trying to understand, you know, what starts as my psyche and, and dived into the psyche of all my customers and clients and friends and, and family, ultimately. Uh, it's such an interesting thing to learn to understand how this uh, brain is dynamically integrated. And if you're interested in it, like I said, Christine, that book, Buddha's Brain, does an extremely great job of um, articulating how all these things work and how we can Yeah, I definitely them. want to read that. I'm curious, why do you think so many people are afraid of success? Because they were told they don't deserve it, right? So as a child, and I'm growing up, I, 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 I've got people in my life who are very much living this reality right now, and it's right in front of me. It's, it's hiding in plain sight. Um, they're told that they don't deserve it, right? Or, or you know, success is reserved mm -hmm. for certain people. Or if you're successful, it must mean you're a bad person. Or you know, all these these stories that we're told as children that we believe, um, you know, people just believe they're inadequate. And and I think that's a big um, reality a lot of us are facing is, um, I just don't believe that I deserve anything more unconsciously. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, so that's why people are afraid to act, right? So they're afraid because they're afraid they're going to hurt. It's going to hurt when they fail or they're afraid of that they're not ready for success. They don't feel like they ha they're, d they're worthy or deserving of success. So every six months, I take on a small group of coaching clients. And I would say more often than is the opposite. Most people are afraid of success and not afraid of failure. Um, you know, it's interesting. And that's just that's observation. really interesting. And I'm curious how that affects the way you interact with your children and making sure that they well trying to make it so that they don't fear success but also you don't you know you don't want them to feel overly cocky because I think that's what people worry about I think that's what people <laughs> worry about and so yes. I mean I think about the way I was raised and I definitely had that fear of success and I think it was because my parents didn't want me to be running around so full of myself but then it kind of went so mm -hmm. far in the opposite direction that I basically learned that I wasn't worthy enough to succeed. I'll tell you what, the, the dynamic of being a parent is the greatest psychological <laughs> experiment. I believe time. it. Um, cause I'll, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so ultimately it, it's my greatest gift in life, right? It's like, I get to, um, attempt to influence these young humans and, and how their psyches develop. 
And I'll tell you my thing, I, I don't want to take away their confidence. I want to direct it. And that means, um, you know, I, I hope they're supremely confident beings, but I want to make sure that they're supremely confident mm -hmm. for a greater purpose. Uh, and so rather than saying, hey, you shouldn't be so self-confident, I'm saying, hey, how are you going to use that self-confidence to help people? And that's the, you know, that's only my, my, my personal articulation is I want them to be supremely confident. I want them to have, you know, the, the greatest amount of confidence in themselves and never take that away from them because I was the opposite of that, right? I was the kid who uh, was always basically beaten into the ground. He said, you know, you can't have anything. You're, you're inadequate. Um, so I, again, I don't say that what my way of doing it is right, but I, what I want my kids to realize is they have the ability at any time to make themselves feel better. They can change their energy. They have the ability at any time to help others and make others feel love and joy. And their greatest purpose in life is serving the greater, uh, the greater cause of humanity. And as long as they can take all that amazing energy and all that amazing love and joy that's inside of them and um, direct it toward a greater, uh, greater good, then I think they're, they can't go wrong. I hope. <laughs> yeah. You know, who knows? That I, is amazing. I don't have yes. the answer, but that's my, my belief. Uh, well, I think that was a great answer. So congratulations. <laughs> and and I'm by, by no stretch am I a perfect parent, trust me, but I'm reading as many books as I can get my hands on. And to be honest, a lot of the guests that I bring on are intentionally like, Hey, I just want to learn from this person about, you know, how they approach parenting because, you know, I really mm -hmm. believe success leaves clues. And if, if they're a, you know, have a great family or at least the parents of a great family, um, then maybe I can can learn something from them. And one of the best guests I've had, and you may want to get him on your podcast, is Pedram Shojai, the, the author of The Urban Monk. Um, really good book. Uh, really simple articulation. Of, he lives in LA. You can coordinate with him. Of mm -hmm. um, simple articulation of how he became a, he was a uh, UCLA grad uh, surgeon, became left it, became a monk for seven years, came back, has since reintegrated, has two kids and a multi million dollar uh, business. And how he's integrating all these things, uh, you know, the practices of monkhood back into his reality uh, in, you know, living in this this current life, the urban life. So super interesting guy, beautiful articulation, not overly weird. And, uh, you know, like you may expect someone who's been seven years a monk to be um, not overly um, forceful with his um, trying to inflict his beliefs on anybody. Just says, hey, man, this is what I do and this is how I feel with my kids. And I learned a lot from him about how to um you know lead your kids yeah i definitely want to look into that and it's you know i don't i don't have kids i don't plan on having kids anytime soon but i love asking people about parenting because i just think i learn a lot about myself mm -hmm. from it yep. um and i also just think i'm very interested in what's happening with this upcoming generation i think we live in a very interesting time and i can't imagine raising someone right now um yeah. in this world and i just like to learn from everybody else and how they do it and their perspective on it more so i'm like i said so i learn about myself but also so i'm i guess prepared and it makes you think about i think it puts things in perspective when you're raising a child in a different perspective <laughs> yeah uh, well i'll tell you the two things that i think are my greatest guiding light as far as being a parent um they're your greatest teachers because mm -hmm. they are a mirror of you uh, if there's something that they lack, it's nothing to do, do with them. It has everything to do with you. That's one. The other thing is um, they see zero or they hear zero of what you say and hear 100% of what you do. And if you can remember those two things, you'll be doing well because you, you could talk all day, right? You could say, don't do this and do this and do that. And it, they do nothing. They do none of it, <laughs> like literally zero. But if they watch you, <laughs> but if they watch you, they will they will do exactly what you do and they will become you. Um, based on your actions and not on your words. And um, if you become a good person, this is why my quest is to become a good person and not to become a good parent. And I think that's the crux or, or the paradox of parenting. It's like, I'm going to read all these parenting books so I can become a better parent. No, stop reading parenting books. Read books to become a better person. And if you become a better person, you become better articulating yourself, you'll become a better parent and your children will become better versions of themselves because they see a great human being in front of them doing great things and having great conversations and being around great people. And that's what children see and, and that will become them. I think that you should release a parenting book that's one page long that just is written out <laughs> what you that. just said. Yeah. So it's funny. My son, my son and I, my son just finished school last week. And, and so every summer, 
uh, or every three months, we, we try to come up with an articulation of what we're going to do for body, mind, and soul. So for his body, he wants to learn how to uh, run faster. For his, his mind, he wants to learn multiplication. And for his soul, we've decided he, we're going to write a children's book together. So we've now started this quest of we're, we're going to figure out a way to write a story for a children's book. So maybe we can put our message into a children's book somehow. <laughs> I think that would be amazing. Yeah, so I... I will support that. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, parents read children's book, right? And that, that was, yeah. so I had a guest on, if you haven't had this guest, another guy you want to have on your podcast, Mike DeSanti was one of my favorite guests of all time and one of the best listened to podcasts ever. Um, he's an incredible human being, and he wrote his first children's book at 17. Um, and he didn't have it published until he was 35, but he wrote it at 17, word for word, still had it published, and, and it does very, very well. Um, but he got me down the path of like how actually not hard it is to get a children's book published. And the reality that children don't read children's books, parents read children's books. Mm -hmm. So if you want, if you want to send an unconscious message to parents, write it in a children's book. Like it sends it to both the the children and the parents. Right. Um, but super interesting thought. I think that's a great tactic and I think it's really interesting to think about. And that's why I think there needs to be a more children's books about gut health. (laughs) Ah, yeah, you know, that may be the perfect thing to write. My son has this amazing wit about him that makes me laugh every day. And I bet he would do the best job writing about children's nutrition for kids. (laughs) You should do it because it's so important and there's this huge hole. And I, you know, I don't know the name of the book off the top of my head, but I know recently there was a children's book that was published and kind of made a big, a big splash in the paleo world because there was a children's book about gut health. And I thought... I, well, I hope so. There should be more so that, yeah. I mean, kids are kind of, they, they're they they're kind of learning about this. But like you said, the parents are reading it and it's putting mm-hmm. it in, in digestible, no pun intended, <laughs> yeah. words for them, you know, for them to really understand. Yes. And, and so, I mean, telling his stories is how kids learn, right? So I teach my son and my, both my kids. Um, about nutrition, this is kind of going on a tangent for the podcast, but we'll leave it on anyways. <laughs> I teach them about, um, so, you know, my son obviously, ha- my, my daughter is an amazing, she's a soldier when she eats, you know, breakfast, I want beef and broccoli. And my son, uh, I want cookies and donuts. So um, teaching him about nutrition was very interesting as well, because, you know, we start talking about the body and, we, we, and he realizes that, you know, these cookies or these desserts make his mouth very happy. But to make the rest of the part, the best other parts of his body happy, he needs these other fruits and vegetables. And even though he doesn't like them, he eats them because he knows it makes the other parts of his body happy. And and that understanding for kids, like just telling to him in a story like that, like, hey, you yes. have, you know, you're going to you have all these other friends that are in your body. And if we can make those other parts happy, he just now will just kind of go and, and go about his business and eat his foods that he doesn't really like because he knows he's making his tummy happy and he knows he's making his heart happy and his brain. And I'm like, God, that's the easiest way to explain this to kids. Uh, mm-hmm. And it makes him get it. And, and they, they make their own decisions that way right then they feel like they're empowered rather than you're forcing them to you know shove broccoli down their throat oh absolutely and that's the key right you want them to be making the decision not you forcing them into something yeah and and my yeah my kids are very very uh resistant to being told what to do very much like i was that's that's (laughs) good i think they'll stand their ground growing up oh yeah yeah, I, w- I was not very good with rules, and m- <laughs> m- both of my children are very much a reflection of me. <laughs> and still to this day, I'm not very good with rules, to be completely honest with you, but I'm working on that. That's okay. I think that rule, you know, sh- life shouldn't have rules. It's good. Absolutely. Christina, so the articulation of my podcast is we're trying to live our greatest life in our greatest body. Knowing that, what would you tell our listeners? What were three things you would tell our listeners to allow them to live their greatest life in their greatest body? Ooh, their greatest life and their greatest body. Well, I think that they should definitely be paying attention to what they're eat or what they're eating and fueling mm-hmm. their body with whole nutrient dense foods. I think that people need to pay attention to who they're surrounding themselves with and the content that they are consuming. Be really, really picky about what content you're consuming and who you're listening to, who you're talking to, you know, the saying we are, you know, a collection of the five people we hang out with the most. Well, nowadays we are, we're not just hanging out with five people. We're hanging out with 5 million every day. You know, you're seeing all these different people and what you're surrounding yourself with becomes you, you know, so choose wisely. And I think that the last thing is really, 
tapping into your tapping into yourself, taking time away from everybody else. And it could be meditation, it could be journaling, it could just be just sitting in silence and thinking, but taking that time for yourself and getting in tune with your own thoughts and facing things that maybe you're trying to numb out to, that's going to lead the way for everything else. Um, So slowing down in that aspect and just really getting back in touch with your own thoughts and paying attention to those and giving yourself some grace, I think. Awesome. I love that. And uh, it's very much in line with with our beliefs and uh, what we're trying to teach. So thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom and for your mission of really trying to empower women with uh, great um, information, a great amount of information and a great skill set to live their greatest life. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I had such a fun time talking to you. So thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Have an amazing day. You too. So I hope you guys enjoyed my very casual conversation with Christina Rice. As always, I love bringing great humans into my world and into your world. And hopefully she will continue to empower women across the world and provide tremendous amounts of information for you, for me, and for everyone she encounters. Thank you very much to Christina Rice for your time and energy that you contribute to helping people. And as always, guys, I appreciate you very much. And if you want to check out our sponsors for this show, uh, Four Sigmatic, thank you guys very much. Foursigmatic.com slash muscle for 15% off Four Sigmatic. Join us on benpokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life.